From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Email scammers posed at DOT officials in phishing messages focused on $1 trillion government bill. Epic confirms it got hacked. And farming groups warn of supply chain chaos after a ransomware attack. These are just some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week in cybersecurity headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Brett Conlon, the CISO at Edelman Financial Engines. Brett, thank you so much for being on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. Rich, thank you. I'm very excited to be on the show. All right. Well, of course, we want to thank our sponsor, Kenu Solutions, for helping make this show possible. We'll be talking about them more in just a minute. And of course, you can join us on Crowdcast. we got the URL right up here. So join in the conversation. We'd love to hear your comments as we cover the news. we got about 20 minutes, though. So let's dive right in. Email scammers pose as DOT officials in phishing messages focused on that $1 trillion bill. Shortly after Congress took action on a $1 trillion infrastructure bill, hackers posing as U.S. Transportation Department officials offered fake project bid opportunities to seduce companies into handing over Microsoft credentials. The ploy included layers of attempts to disguise the malicious appeals as authentic government solicitations. But as researcher Roger Kay of the firm INKY stated, the victims might have noticed that something was up when they, if they had realized that the phishing site domains ended in .com rather than .gov or .mil. You know, we get this question a lot on the show, Brett, but, you know, how can we train people to, I guess, to be more vigilant for phishing? Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later as kind of the the evolution of phishing uh, schemes kind of going forward. But, you know, is this a is this a training problem? Is is this process? You know, what, what is the solution here? So I think that we have to start with user awareness. Right. And so there's the user element. There's the company and organization element? And then what are we doing about that? So when I'm talking about user awareness, we want to do regular training. We want our users to stay vigilant. So something as terms of like, you know, whether it's coming from the .com, .gov, .mil, what are the things that they should be looking at in every email when they receive it to um, alert them that this might not actually be a legit email? And then from the organizational side, how are you making that easy for your employees? If there's something that comes in that they're suspicious about, it should be at a point right now where they click a button, that they know they have to click that button, and that goes right to the security team. And then the security team should be looking at how can we automate this process? So if we have a mass campaign, how do we go in, take all these emails out before all the other users receive them or before all the other users read them so that we can uh, be proactive in that approach? And then I'll ask the companies, what are they doing about the mobile element? So um, we know more and more people are using their mobile devices to check their email. How do you make it easy for your employees to report phishing on an email or report something they suspect is phishing uh, on a mobile device so that the uh, security team can take action on it? All right. Our next story here, Epic confirms it got hacked. The web host Epic confirmed an unauthorized intrusion to its systems, possibly performed by Anonymous, at least they're taking credit for it. The 180 gigabytes of leaked data includes over 15 million email addresses belonging to Epic's customers and perhaps problematically non-customers, the latter of which have been the result of Epic having scraped who is records of domains it didn't own. Have I Been Pwned has been tracking this, leading to everyone fearing receiving email warnings from Troy Hunt. Truly, the day we all uh, uh, have dread for in our hearts. But Brett, I mean, does this look like a situation where, you know, we should start questioning the amount of data organizations need versus keep? I know Epic is getting a lot of attention here because they're kind of the host of last resort, perhaps, uh, for for a lot of, um, you know, maybe sketchy causes. But is this is this kind of a wider problem, I guess, for this need versus keep data uh, retention? This comes up all the time. When I'm talking to my cybersecurity buddies, we have a group of about three or four of us that um, sit down at our buddies, what we call the foxhole, which is a, a bourbon bar. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> right here, we talk about this in terms of it's a constant battle between the marketing teams, between the organization, and how much how much do they want to keep versus how much does an organization need to actually keep in terms of data on their users. So I found it also interesting in this article that they said they were not aware of the breach because to me that symbols, symbolizes that we don't have the best holding statement in, in place. And that's a, very important for our company to have so that if a reporter does call or if the FBI comes knocking or someone uh, wants to publish an article, you have a great holding statement. But I think at, 
uh, ultimately the company needs to really figure out what kind of data do we actually need versus what is it just a liability that's not worth it? And and um, the cyber insurance companies are taking a look at, at a look at that as well. And just real quick here, in terms of you know, uh, there's this saying out there for a while now that like data is the new oil. But you know, talking about in terms of data being a liability, is this also about like assessing when data has value for an organization in terms of being able to be like, okay, you know, for a marketing perspective, this data has a shelf life. We don't need to be holding on to you know, very clearly dated who is records in the case of Epic, for example. Exactly. I mean, I don't think that I would say that data is the new oil or that all data is the new oil, but um, there's certain pieces that they need to know that are important to them, but the stuff that they're not using and that there's not even a reason to have after a certain amount of time, get rid of it. And you should be working with counsel to get rid of it. All right. Our next uh, story here, ransomware hammers banking. That's according to a new report from Trend Micro. The banking industry was disproportionately impacted by ransomware in the first half of 2021, with attacks up 1,318% on the year. And analysts are saying this is likely due to a perceived higher likelihood of a payout from the attackers. I guess they figure they have the money they'll pay. Other, uh, overall, the most dedicated, uh, the most detected malware in the six-month period was actually crypto miners. So not ransomware as one might assume here. But Brett, you know, we have hacking continuing to evolve here as someone in the financial services industry yourself, you know, what are your first go-to ideas for, for kind of dealing with this kind of just giant escalation? Yeah. Um, the attacks aren't going anywhere. So when we look at our attacks and what's going on, follow the money and the ability to, to disrupt a business. Um, our hygiene has to get better. The fact that we're still seeing these ransomwares have the impact that they do uh, is a problem. Um, and I, you know, I've started to see some articles about uh, sort of polarizing opinions on whether you pay or don't pay, but that ultimately comes down to a business decision. I know we're going to talk a little bit about that later on, but it really has to be a business decision. Does it make sense to pay for the business? Does it make sense not to pay for the business? Um, but I would also tell the business that if you don't think um, that security is that important, then you shouldn't be the one clamoring to say, let's pay right away, we need to get back up and running. Because if you need to pay right away and get back up and running, then I think we need to put more emphasis around and more money around what we're devoting to the security in our company. All right, yeah, and kind of an analogous uh, story here, kind of going more into detail on that. Our next story, Farming Group warns of supply chain chaos after ransomware attack. New Cooperative, a major U.S. grain producer based in Iowa, was hit by ransomware from Black Matter, a group that some believe has links to Dark Matter, the group thought to be responsible for the Colonial Pipeline incident. Reps from New Cooperative in negotiations visible on Twitter basically said to the attackers, you have no idea what you've done here, referring to the scope of potential food shortages as a result of the attack. And an update to the story, a second farming cooperative, the Minnesota-based Crystal Valley, also shut down this week. So, Brett, um, seems like you know, the, these attackers in this instance are very aware of the power of disrupting uh, precarious infrastructure, you know, kind of talking about, you know, making sense for a business, knowing that it holds that position in infrastructure. I mean, do you feel like the current administration should be doing more to bolster this at a grassroots level or, or kind of what can be done, uh, I guess, um, from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not sold that cracking down on Russia will materially deter cyber criminals. Mm -hmm. They'll just move elsewhere. So we saw this with the business email compromise in Nigeria. Um, Nigeria got serious about cracking down on it, and they uh, bad actors moved elsewhere. It also didn't slow the BEC tax down. So we need to continue pressure, but ultimately companies again need to come back to stepping up their investment and prioritization of security. So like I mentioned before. If you can't afford to be down this amount of time, and we're and we're seeing here where they're talking about they're shutting their pieces down, and all the um, you know, domino effect that that's going to have on the company, then we need to see um, the company bulking up their investment and making security a priority. And on the flip side, government needs to provide actionable intel to those groups so that they can do um, a better job of securing their products and being able to ultimately deliver those products. 
Uh, Brett, that's great. I love the the historical you know context for like the you know the BEC stuff. I think that's that's something that's not talked about enough, and I really appreciate that insight. But one thing I want to spend a second on here is to thank our sponsor, Kenu Solutions. Over the next few weeks, Kenu Solutions is offering a series of educational sessions on a variety of topics in security, such as endpoints, networks, privileged access management, Internet of Things, and governance, risk management, and compliance or GRC. Attend these sessions to get some savvy education from the security experts at Kenu Solutions. You can also get a $20 Uber Eats gift card just for attending. You can participate in Kenu Solutions' Lunch and Learn by registering at kenusolutions.com slash events. All right, our next story here, key lawmakers to CISA, let us send you some more money and some more power. Two separate House uh, committees have this year advanced legislation to give CISA a total of $800 million more to add to its current $2 billion total budget. Those proposed, fun- those proposed funds come on top of another extra $650 million that Congress and President Biden provided to CISA in March through the American Rescue Plan. They also want to make CISA the hub where vital companies would report major cybersecurity incidents and extend the CISA director's tenure to a five-year term to insulate the department against politics, something we saw uh, uh, late last year or, yeah, late last year uh, becoming a major issue. Um, you know, Brett, what are your thoughts about the size and scope of this initiative? A lot of money going there. Does CISA have the mandate to make the best use of that? I, you know, I think it's a great start. So when we see that we're prioritizing it, which we're seeing here, when we see that we're investing in it, which we just talked about um, a few seconds ago, that's a great start. But I think that helping standardize what an incident is, that's uh, up in the air with a lot of companies and, and a lot of regulators in terms of defining what an incident is and what has to be reported. And then also making that reporting straightforward. Um I would like to see an easy way for the companies to go ahead and report that stuff out. And then also, how is the government going to help those companies when they report those incidents? Those are all important steps. Do you feel like from what you've seen of CISA that like, again, obviously there's a lot of attention on this. So it's in if we want to be cynical, representative's best interest to make it seem like they're doing something, throwing money at stuff is a good way to make it seem like you're taking security seriously. Are you seeing the indications that like, like that, that process is going to happen? Um, not just in like terms of defining incidents, but like literally just making it easy. I think there was a survey out that most, uh, CISOs don't even know how to like report a cybersecurity incident if something comes up. I haven't seen that so far. So I would like to see that, but I'm going to, uh, give benefit of the doubt that these things take a little bit of time. But right now, I think that um, there's still a lot of confusion there. Okay. Next up here, now we have to worry about FAS. Microsoft's security team announced it discovered a phishing as a service, or P-H-A-A-S, sure, why not, organization dubbed Bulletproof Link that provides phishing services to cybercriminal organizations. Clients pay Bulletproof Link $800 to register, after which it provides built-in hosting for phishing URLs, email sending services, and collecting credentials from attacks. Also has a really nice UI, I just have to say from the screenshots that I saw. Bulletproof Link also maintains a separate store for new phishing email templates, so even Fishing criminals have an app store, it seems like. Uh, so looking at this, you know, aside from the irony of Microsoft discussing an as a service operation that works from that, that derives revenue from templates, uh, <laughs> we've seen with Office for years, you know, this this kind of new fast or whatever you want to end up calling this. I know we're running out of acronyms with as a service. Um, does this seem like just one more thing that CISOs have to add to their vulnerability checklist? Like how much of a priority should this be? Is this like a game changer, like ransomware as a service it seemed like it was in terms of escalation? I I would not think so. So I think that anyone who's looking at the crime as a service, as I would like to call it, um, it's been out there for a while. There's nothing new here. You can go buy the latest ransomware as a service for $10 on the dark web and deploy it and see what happens. Um, Now you have phishing as a service, which you should already be training your users and doing user awareness training on how to protect against that. Um, I think that companies can take... uh, a page out of the criminal's playbook in terms of they're focusing on the user experience. They're focusing on building a nice uh, UI for the criminals to take advantage of. So um, they're already going digital. So we need to take a look at that. But um, when we really think about this, the the as a service, both in the uh, respectable space of software as a service and the criminal space is crime as a service. It's all out there. 
Um, it's about making as, as much money as they can and making it as accessible as possible. And uh, everyone should be looking at what is their risk to the organization and how can they minimize that risk for their organization. Next up here, Revil double crosses ransomware affiliates using sneaky backdoor tactics. This kind of gets back to our you know crime as a service uh, topic that we're just talking about. New reports confirm that the Revil ransomware as a service operation has been scamming its affiliates out of their ransom payments. In Revil's ransomware model, developers create the malware and maintain the underlying infrastructure and then recruit affiliates to attack victims, dividing the proceeds between the two parties with the affiliates taking a substantially larger cut, typically around 70 to 80 percent, depending on services rendered. Researchers say that when Talks reached a critical point, Revil would use a backdoor in its software to take over the chat, posing as the victim refusing to pay and would then continue the negotiations with the victim in order to obtain a full ransom payment. No, this isn't a spy thriller. This is, I guess, just Revil's way of doing stuff. But Brett, I mean, <laughs> in terms of like super villainry, it seems like Revil is kind of at the forefront of, of crime as a service. But I uh, you know, with these kind of unpredictable tactics, kind of double dealing with both their clients and potential victims, does that kind of level of creativity, I guess, worry you, you know, going forward, you know, considering that these ransomware strains seemingly have a long life, even when a, when a name shuts down, a lot of the operators and people behind it just move on to a, to a different, uh, you know, a different nomenclature. Well, I think the first thing is the phishing as a service people need to take note of what's happening here. Yeah. Um, because they're going to get cheated out of some money. So maybe it's not as uh, lucrative as they thought it was going to be. Well, the, and we've already we've already seen just to, just to, as a note on that, we've already seen Microsoft said that there's indication that the people that are operating those are keeping the credentials, not just passing them on and storing them up to use them for their own purposes, probably to sell them, I'm assuming, as a data set down the road as well. So, it, you know, clearly it turns out <laughs> trusting criminals as a service not exactly in, in anyone's best interest. And who would have thought, right? Um, <laughs> that, that we don't have honest criminals just doesn't make sense to me. And at that <laughs> ransomware as a service and honest criminals didn't always work out for everyone. I know that's shocking. I'm, 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 I'm one of the people who's very surprised by it. But um, I think that you can just expect to see that more often. And this is going to play a part in... Uh, a couple of different areas. I think it's going to play a part in how companies approach paying ransomware or paying the amount of money um, the criminals are asking for. Because if they think there's a backdoor, they think there's another a company coming in or organization coming in asking for more money. Um, that's going to be a, a, a talking point. And then also, if you know the criminals start turning against each other and they're not being honest with each other, then I think that that can backfire against them. Companies might not be so trusting of what's going to actually happen once they pay that money. And they might uh, put more money into, I don't know, security and resiliency. <laughs> well, they are a superstitious and cowardly lot. So we have to keep that in mind. But also really want a quick uh, shout out to John G for asking, do fast providers provide frequent flyer miles per email sent? That's another downside, I feel like, to uh, uh, employing a, a, cr a crime as a service. Um, you know, you don't get those nice perks. You're not going to get platinum status. Uh, with your phishing as a service provider, I don't think so, uh, T John. They today, today, <laughs> we will we will see. There's probably some crypto wallet that'll do that for you, right? Uh, all right, and our final story of the day: Who watches the Watchers? iOS 15, evidently. Apple released iOS 15 this week, and one of the new features in the privacy settings is record app activity. Users can either wait a few days for the OS to generate a report once you activate this, or you can just export a JSON file with the data anytime. According to developer documentation, this feature will show if an app accesses the photo library, camera, microphone, contacts, uh, media library, location, screen sharing, and I think most importantly, or most interestingly, what domains an app reaches out to. So Brett, uh, lots to unpack here balance between security and spyware, you know, is, is this, who is this useful for, I guess, and does this change anything from a security perspective? Well, all the commercial businesses are always doing something that's designed for the user, but also benefits them. So I'm sure this benefits Apple in some way. As a government employee, um, you know, Apple was always a challenge. Uh, <laughs> as, a, as a private citizen, uh, I think this is a great step forward in terms of Apple putting users in control of their data. And um, from a security professional perspective, I think that when we talk about 
building applications and building products that consumers are going to be consuming, uh, we want to see security by design. And this is a great example of putting users in control of their data and obviously building in security by design so that we can see who's using our data and for what purpose and when. Um, obviously, now Apple has information as well on that, but they probably already had that information. And so this at least allows us to opt out and take action on that, where before we have not been able to do that. So uh, I'm a fan of it. All right. And before we get out of here, Brett, was there any story that was a thumbs up, an eye roller, apathy, love, hate? What fe- what story generated the feelings for you? I, I think I'm still always shocked with the crime as a service. It's not going anywhere. And I think that companies really need to take a hard look at what their security posture is. And if they can't, con- if they can't afford to be down, then let's really take a hard look at the prioritization of security in that company and the investment of security in that company. Because ultimately, that's what's going to help reduce these risks and help put these criminals out of business. They're not going anywhere, but they're also looking at the path of least resistance. Words of wisdom from Brett Conlon, the CISO at Edelman Financial Engines. Brett, where can people find you if they are so inclined? Uh, You can find me on LinkedIn under Brett Conlon. All right. So thank you, Brett. We really appreciate you being on the show. Uh, It was awesome. Great conversation. Great points. And we also want to thank our sponsor, Kenu Solutions, for helping make this show possible. I want to remind you, if you're on Reddit, take note. We have an AMA with all of the CISO hosts from the CISO series shows, including our headline show, running today through September 30th. So get in there. You can, as the name implies, ask us anything. Uh, So check that out for sure. And we're also going to be having a party next Thursday to celebrate our three year anniversary. So you can find information on that at CISOseries.com. Come. You can also come back uh, next week for our Friday video chat uh, that's going to be all about hacking resiliency, an hour of critical thinking on withstanding the brunt of cyber attacks. That starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, followed by speed dating. And then we'll be back with another edition of the Week in Review, Friday, 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Remember, of course, you can catch cybersecurity headlines, as Brett does, every single day, six minutes or less. You can get all the headlines that you need to know in security. You can check it out, CISO series. Com. Until then, I'm Rich Raffalino, reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.